Recently, the Society for Vascular Surgery has decided to sponsor an audiovisual archive to feature the outstanding leaders and contributors in vascular surgery. A committee composed of Jimmy Yow, Norm Rich, Cal Ernst, and me was formed to undertake interviews of our most famous and distinguished colleagues. My name is Roger Gregory, and today I will be conducting an interview with the legendary surgeon, Dr. Julius Jacobson, a modern Renaissance man. Dr. Jac Jacobson, thank you for agreeing. It's to an this honor interview. to be with you. Yes, sir. I have been involved with surgery and uh, so on for a long time. And this is the most original interview that I've ever had. And this is due to Dr. Gregory. And it's an entirely new principle of getting to know people, how they came about doing what they did. And I think it's, it's original. But let's seriously go back to your early days. You were born in 1927. In, That's correct. In Toledo. That's correct. Thus making you much older than you look and act. Isn't that a nice thing for you to say? Well, it's the truth. Because I have had a, uh, a party a year or two ago, and I am very old, and I decided that I wanted to have another party in 2027. Please invite me. Well, I'm inviting people, and that's why I'm telling you now. Why did I pick him to sort of host, help me develop this party in 2027? And the answer is that I felt that he, from this short half an hour we've had together, was so original and had such good thoughts that he would have a lot of clout up there. <laughs> <laughs> and when I asked him, the party would take place in 2027. So you all are invited. Will you put that in your calendar, please? We'll be there. Absolutely. Okay. Now, t tell us about your parents. Both from Toledo, Ohio. My father, a lawyer. Uh, my mother, a good mother. And... Uh, my my father was never tremendously successful as far as finance is concerned, but he was a wonderful man. Your grandfather was a famous surgeon. My grandfather was a famous surgeon. He married my grandmother, who was in the first class to graduate a woman from McGill Medical School. And she was very special, and I got to know her. I was complimenting the history of science before and that I was reading a book on the 1918 flu epidemic. I am a second. I realized that I owe my name, which is a second, to the flu epidemic. So I have great respect for the flu epidemic. I learned something the other day. I, I am enjoying words. I've always enjoyed words. But where does the word uh, malaria come from? Oh, no. What is it? Say it. Malaria. Say it in two syllables. Mal area. Now, what is it? Where does it come from? Bad area. What's area? Air. Bad air. Bad air. So that's where the term malaria comes from. Wow. You can't say wow. Because. I've been working with a uh, <clears throat> company, a Warren Buffett company up in Greenwich, Connecticut. And the problem is, you say, when, when do I stop doing things? But what this amounts to, patients with uh, diabetes uh, tend to end up with amputations. And one of the common reasons is that they lose sensation in their feet. And when they're standing with the full weight of the body pressing down on a couple bones in the bottom of the foot, that pressure is enough to stop the blood flow. They develop infection, gangrene, and we end up having to amputate. 
So I have gotten the idea of putting a water bed in a shoe. Excellent. So there are no pressure points. I've been working with a company on that, and uh, this is H.H. H. Brown, which is the uh, uh, Warren Buffett company. And uh, what would you call this shoe? Who walked on water? Jesus. So we decided originally to call it the Jesus shoe. <laughs> and then it was realized that this might not be well received in some circles. <laughs> So that a group I'm also working with uh, at Columbia, uh, some of the young people uh, jokingly had started to call it the wow shoe. Wow for what? Walk on water. The company has now patented that name, the wow shoe. Well, I'll still use wow. Okay. But well, I know what it means if you wanna, if you, if, Particularly if you have a dog. I want to talk a little bit about your early education, Dr. Ju uh, Jacobson. You. You went to grammar school at, in public school. When I was eight years old, my parents moved from Chicago to New York. Right. My father, the lawyer. And we drove up Broadway, and on 103rd Street, I believe it's still to this day, there is a Marseilles Hotel. We stopped there for the night and lived there for some years and then got other uh, places to live in the area. And I went to PS 54, eight years old, and then PS 165, which is 109th Street for junior high school. And then you're about to ask me about Townsend Harris, which is one of the great schools I've ever been to. Townsend Harris was the first uh, ambassador to Japan and City College, not City University, but City College decided they were going to start a high school and have their college professors teach the high school students. And this was original, it was highly competitive testing to get into it and you graduated in three years instead of four. So you graduated at age 15? I was 15, that's right. I think this has to be a clue that you may have been gifted. May have been what? Gifted. Giffy? Get gifted. Smart. Intelligent. Bright. You know Osler. Yes, sir. What was Osler's definition of medicine? Hmm. I don't know. What he said was the important thing, the magic word of medicine was work. Right. And he defined work as what made the dull student bright, the bright student brilliant, and the brilliant student steady. And I don't think I'm, intelligence-wise, anything special, but I work hard. That counts for a giant area of progress, I'm convinced. Now, because you were so young, you didn't go to college right away. You worked as a photographer. Now, how did that happen? I had no money to go to college. It was that simple. And at the end of the year, I think I told you one of my professors felt sorry for me, sent me out to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and uh, working with a man who had, was writing the first book on the cell. The cell was something new. But that was after you went to college. And it was, it was after that, when I was refused by the 23 medical schools, that the... Uh, that you got up. That my mentor, one of my mentors that year, felt sorry for me and sent me to uh, where I worked on the paramecium. Now, by 17 at Toledo University, you already had three years credit before you were brought into the military. What was be being a pharmacist mate like? Was that I a good time it. in your life? I, uh, I realized how little I knew. The one magic thing that I had was elixir of turpentine hydrate and codeine, which had 70% alcohol so that aboard ship I was very special. 
<laughs> and I could get as much elixir of turpentine hydrate as I wanted. And uh, the Navy was absolutely fascinating at that period. And then I enlisted very close. I enlisted on my 17th birthday, and that was when they dropped the atomic bomb so that I got out of the Navy quickly. Right. Then you finished, completed your last year at Toledo. Now you're 18 years old. Then you applied to 23 medical schools, were rejected by 23 medical schools. I have to ask, certainly that you saw this as a failure, but you didn't. Why? One, I realized that millions of people were returning from the service. So there was this tremendous number of people that were highly qualified that I was resisting. I also am Jewish, and being Jewish, getting into medical school was reputed to be much harder than it was if you were non-Jewish. Well, during that time, after being rejected, though, something actually wonderful happened. That was when you went to work at the University of Pennsylvania for the cellular physiologist and learned... L.V. Heilbrunn mentioned his name because I owe him a great deal. Obviously, because he recognized what you were doing, what your abilities were, and during that time, you learned to use the microscope, studying the paramecium, a skill that came out much later and was turned out to be important for us I all. was working every day with a microscope, right? Obviously, you did very well academically there. You got your master's degree, but most important, you got strong letters of recommendation, then reapplied to medical school. And what happened? That's right. I got it in every place I applied. And I chose Johns Hopkins. I owe a great deal to Hopkins, but what I think of Hopkins when I was there is the most original part of it is when they wanted to honor a member of the faculty, the honor was giving him a student assignment rather than some committee or what have you. Wonderful. Now, when you went to Hopkins early on, did you have any contact with Dr. Blaylock? Yes, indeed. He was my hero. What was he like? A uh, very uh, common but brilliant, lovely person. I later learned that he uh, took too many drugs. I didn't know that at the time. and was an addict. But uh, he was one of the great teachers I've ever had. But the fortunate part of that great teaching was that there were, who was the woman uh, responsible for the blue baby operation? Tossing. Tausig, yeah. Uh, I forget her first name, but Tausig was there. There were a group of people. They were absolutely brilliant, and anything you did was original at the time. When did you get married? 1972. Graduated from medical school in 1952. Did you have children? Yes. I have had five children, and I have great guilt about them now. This is something that I suspect many of the people that are listening to this lecture share. But why do I feel guilty about my children? Because that work ethic, which I told you about, kept me from taking them on vacations, going to their sports games very often, and so on and so forth. And I'm having just the opposite experience with my grandchildren, who I'm enjoying everything they do. And they go from 18, 19 to eight years old. And I'm just enjoying them all tremendously. I think that guilt is well balanced, though, with 
when we get into some of the contributions that you have made with this hard work. Let me ask about your residency. You went to Columbia Presbyterian for seven years, including a fellowship in thoracic surgery at Bellevue. Was this productive time for you? Do you have good memories of this? And Absolutely wonderful memories. Columbia was one of the great places I've ever been. Uh, there's a man who sort of nurtured me in plastic surgery by the name of John Connolly, oh, who yes. I'm sure you know. Oh, yes. And he was, uh, a f had some sort of title at Columbia where he was a visiting professor. And uh, he was a wonderful influence on my life. We're friends to this day. Before your residency started, I think the story goes that you saw Voorhees implant sutures in the heart. He came up with the Vignon engraft. The way the Vignon engraft I appreciated at the time was that he was doing some experimental work on the heart. And I was looking at these pathological specimens and realized that every stitch that was in the heart was covered by uh, fiber, fibrous tissue. And I, he and I both realized that maybe this would offer some uh, future to vascular surgery. And Arthur Voorhees started using the Vinyan N, and that's Arthur's contribution. And then all the other common grafts came into being. Now, during this time also, you developed a pneumatic cuff to modulate the constriction of the aneurysm neck. And this worked out pretty well. This worked out wonderfully well uh, in that uh, Dr. Blakemore had developed a technique that they were excited by. I guess it was Voorhees. Voorhees was Blakemore's assistant. And they started uh, taking patients and just taking a cuff and tightening the cuff and feeling the pulse in the cuff with their fingers. And they would, when the pulse disappeared in the aneurysm, they would stop doing the surgery. And they were operating on many patients each day. It wasn't a hard, uh, long, difficult operation. And who comes in as the intern but me. <laughs> and I was frustrated by having to call Blakemore so often that the result, the immediate result was not good. And I got the Dayball Rubber Company to produce a cuff, pneumatic cuff, or uh, contained fluid eventually, and put on the end of this cuff a catheter which was self-sealing, and the end of the catheter you could feel beneath the skin and you could stick a needle into it and you could add uh, or subtract small amounts of fluid. We could put that cuff around and then put the needle in and that was a very important principle because we started working in the lab for it and I had a woman who I've lost track of and I hope she hears one of these DVDs you're putting out her name was Martha Adams, and I, I've asked about her, but I haven't been able to find out where she was and who she was and what happened with her. But she had a pet, and we went over to the roof of the uh, dog lab, the roof where the dog lab was, and uh, just to, we were experimenting with putting this on the vena cava and getting what do you call it when you have a lot of fluid in the belly? Ascites. Ascites. Producing ascites and studying this entity. Mm. And she had one of, uh, she had a dog there who was a pet. And I went over one evening to see the dog with her. And she took the dog out and a couple of the uh, men who worked in the lab started throwing a ball back and forth. And the dog had been somebody's pet and the dog started running after the ball and then started to limp. Well, I had learned long ago that the word claudication 
was from the Emperor Claudius who limped. And I realized that we had an experimental way of making claudication and we got a treadmill and we started putting uh, these dogs on the treadmill and studying how long it took the collateral vessels to develop when you uh, blocked a vessel. And then uh, also realized that why was sometimes when you put a graft in, vascular surgery was new, and the graft closed off, why was the patient worse off after the graft closed off than they were before you put it in? Well, I think what I've just told you, the answer is obvious, because when the graft closed off, the collateral vessels were closed off, and uh, it took a long time for those collateral vessels to redevelop, and you could assay all this by putting the patient on a treadmill. I won't say wow. Good. <laughs> now, you don't have a dog? <laughs> have two. Well, then you better start saying wow again. <laughs> now, after your residency training, you started the practice portion of your career starting as an attending at Columbia Presbyterian, but quickly changed to the University of Vermont. Why? Because I had done, uh, written some papers that were uh, not profound, but uh, were, were new on the cell. And the uh, University of Vermont called one day and said, uh, we would like to appoint you as a uh, professor of surgery, an associate professor of surgery, make you director of surgical research in the department, and uh, want you to come up and do some work for us. And from being at the bottom of the heap, this concept of being able to have my own department, and it's important to mention that the NIH was pouring money into a lot of the small medical schools. Vermont spoke for this. They had some new lab, animal labs and so on and so forth, and I couldn't resist it, and I went up there. And the first problem that I was confronted with was they had developed a, uh, a new drug, and I've never really understood what the drug was, but at any rate, they felt that the, the basic test that they wanted to determine about this drug, what would happen if they uh, denervated the carotid arteries. Well, this was something nobody knew, and they started to try to denervate the carotid arteries, and they felt they couldn't do it reliably. And I'm the new man on the, uh, in the department, and they said, solve this for us. And I realized that the only way to solve it was to divide the artery and rejoin it. Well, this is a couple millimeter diameter vessel. And the teaching was you couldn't work on anything below seven millimeters in diameter. Because I couldn't get into medical schools, rejected by 23 <laughs> different medical schools. <laughs> I realized that one needed the microscope, brought the microscope into the operating room, developed a double binocular microscope with Zeiss in West Germany. There's a whole story there. But why West Germany? Because they were with the Americans where East Germany wasn't. And uh, we developed that double binocular microscope. We took that into the operating room and first we're just using... Uh, uh, loops. Binocular loops, yeah, uh, loops, but a binocular loop. And uh, started using that and we could uh, we could cut a carotid and rejoin it without any problem. And then I started working with different instrument companies. And the, one of the great contributors was... Mueller. No, that was for instruments, but for suture materials. Ethicon. Ethicon. Worked with Ethicon. And uh, that's a funny story in itself. I want to say, before we talk about the... the microvascular surgery, which everyone sees you as the father of microvascular surgery. 
the importance of your being able to transpose experience A into experience B. And the experience A was seen as a failure. You had to work with the microscope looking at paramecia. This had to be a failure. And yet, you were able to transpose that to another wildly successful area, which leads to the first of three key areas of interest that I'd like to focus on in this interview. Specifically, you wouldn't mind if I come and visit you every week, would you? I would love it. Okay. I would love it. We'd have a great time. So you, at first you used a microscope that the eye and ear people were using when the, the ocular loop was inadequate, but concluded from all of that that anything less than seven millimeters, you needed a microscope. And that was what led to your quest to develop the, a proper operating microscope. Now tell us about those times. The company that was producing most of microscopes was Zeiss. Right. World War II had just ended really, or ended fairly recently. And I approached the Zeiss company, but I did it the West German Zeiss. There was an East German Zeiss and a West German Zeiss, but the West Germans were felt better toward the United States. And I approached them, and they liked the idea. They said, oh, we can never guarantee that we will produce more than one, but we will go ahead. And this, uh, I later found out, was based on Zeiss and Abbe many years before developing Zeiss. And they, when they had developed the original Zeiss company, said we're going to take our profits and split them 50-50, with 50% going to us, but 50% going to research. And that is how the Zeiss company became preeminent on that principle. Now tell me about the technology from the Norden bomb site, how that was used to develop the scope. I learned that today from you. <laughs> but in all of I this, don't know the answer. The dipper But why don't I ask you? I don't know. I know I was hoping to find out today. But the diploscope was born. But I need to ask you also, where is the prototype now? I, I heard used I used the prototype for a number of years and then I gave it to the Smithsonian in Washington. And I, I wanted to see it, and I had to go down to the museum in Washington to see it again. So that's where it is now? That's where it is now. And the only difference between what they're producing now and what they produced then is, in principle, putting motors on uh, the microscope so they could uh, make it go up and down and so on and so forth where they had to do everything by hand previously. But it wasn't just the diploscope. You had then to develop instrumentation, suture material, tables, stages to steady the hand, and also develop a totally new technique of using only the fingers and not the wrist. How That's does, right. How we we analyzed what, what was going on. I learned something, uh, this wrist movement from Dr. Castro Viejo. And Castro Viejo was kind enough at one point to give me a satin covered black uh, page which had a dozen different uh, needle holders on it with different principles. And he was the one that taught me this principle that you need finger motion and not wrist motion because the fingers are much more sensitive. Now it was interesting to me and I'm sure when you look back you find this to be incredulous. When you first reported the microscopic anastomosis, one of the discussants criticized this as being ridiculous. Ridiculous, that's right. And impractical. And I'm not going to mention his name. But 
Not everyone saw it that way, particularly plastic surgery, neurosurgery, and an entire new subspecialty was formed. Now, in 1962, you returned to, Mount, to Manhattan to Mount Sinai, this time as the director of vascular surgery. Before going into our second area of interest, tell us for a moment about what you've done in China. Dr. Yao was very interested, and he says you're so well known there. I enjoy the Chinese. I found them as bright a group of people as any I had ever worked with. And uh, one of the, the leading vascular surgeon in China was a man by the name of Chen. And I think I'm pronouncing it right. And he sent his daughter to the United States to take up plastic surgery. And he had already taught her microsurgery. But he asked me if I would look after her. So I have, this is, she's all but almost been a member of the family ever since. And this was the basic interest in China. And now uh, he's left, but there is a, uh, a Chinese surgeon who I've also become close to, who is responsible for a oh, what's the liver disease? Cirrhosis? No, no. Something in the liver, uh, an abnormality. And he's been responsible for that and using the microscope for that. And uh, that's where the Chinese. Not Bud Chiari. Bud Chiari syndrome. Yes. The second area of focus that I want to discuss is your role as a philanthropist. And I have to say that I'd never heard of anything like this from a surgeon endowing three chairs of vascular surgery. Now it's five chairs. Five chairs. Can I tell another story I that wish I you think would. is very pertinent? I wish you would. Uh, I met early on uh, a man by the name of Feinberg. You know his first name? Harvey Feinberg. Harvey Feinberg is in charge of the Institute of Medicine in Washington, which has a great clout. But when Harvey was dean of the medical school, I'm sorry, dean of the School of Public Health, I was asked to be on the visiting committee. Why, I don't know, but at any rate, they asked me to be on the committee of the Harvard School of Public Health, the visiting committee. And I went on it. Harvey and I developed a friendship. I was starting to write the book on music. He knew much more than I ever did about music. I ever have <laughs> about music. And became a good friend. And I wanted to do something for him. I had a big practice in New York at this point. And I went to the uh, then president of Harvard, whose name escapes me, but it was the man that followed Larry Summers. And I went to him and I said, I would like to establish a chair uh, for the deanship at Harvey Feinberg. And he said, absolutely not. And I was shocked. <laughs> Why? Because it is a rule at Harvard that the dean can fire anybody. And if I if we gave Harvard if we gave Harvey Feinberg a chair, a endowed chair, which you're asking us to do, we could not fire him. And that would be terrible. <laughs> so that uh, Harvey ended up going to Chicago. I think one of the most influential groups in the country is the Institute of Medicine, which is called on every problem in medicine, and they have committees and so on and so forth. And uh, Harvey has maintained this friendship. Now, you have established chairs in vascular surgery at Mount Sinai, Johns Hopkins, the Hadashah Hebrew University. Right, I University of Toledo. University of but Toledo. The, uh, the one in Toledo is a uh, uh, chair in parasitology. Just happens that I got to know somebody there and needed it. And, and 
as well as making a giant contribution to the research initiative program for SVS, endowing several research fellowships and academic awards, working through the American College. But the one I'm most proud of, that I've gotten most satisfaction, is the one at the College of Surgeons, the American College of Surgeons, and that's an annual award given each year, and it's called the Innovation Award, and it's a big uh, meeting of the Board of Regents and a dinner to honor this person. Wow. And it's just lovely, but you can't say wow anymore. I won't. I think I explained that to you, <laughs> did I not? The, another unique feature of this philanthropy was that I really was uh, attracted to the fact that you insisted on an audiovisual conference between these institutions so that they would share information. Unique. How, how did you c come to these ideas? Well, I felt that uh, Johns Hopkins could teach a great deal to Israel, the Hadassah Hospital in Israel, and who was the third at the time? Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. I felt that these three could get together, and the way it worked out was that they could meet at 7 o'clock in the morning once a month and have this conference. But my main factor was helping Israel at that point uh, in the teaching that, Terrific. that occurred. Terrific. And when it started, then lots was going on in Israel as far as Bayam. And I won't go through that history, but people were getting injured all the time. And Israel could not be there often enough because there would be a shooting the night before or something in the people that would be at the conference should have been in the operating room and so on and so forth. So that died. Uh, the people at Hadassah have come to me fairly recently and uh, asked to reestablish this. And I've asked Michael Marin, who's now the professor of surgery at Sinai, if he can lend his, but nothing seems to happen. Now, I've been asked by one of the members of our committee to ask you another question about philanthropy. Do you have future plans in this area? Yeah. <laughs> my, fir my first plan at the moment is that I have a fair amount of money in a company, not in a company, but in an uh, investment sort of thing, with the William Blair Company. And... I have decided, and it's a hard thing to do from the standpoint of deductions and so on, but I have 11 children and 11 grandchildren, I mean 11 total of children and grandchildren, and I'm going on my 85th birthday, so I've told you about the party in 2027, which I want you to go to, but I'm not sure you're going to be successful that I'm going to get to 2027. So I would like to give the money this year while I'm alive to those 11 children. Absolutely. And my first daughter, well, one of my daughters, not my first daughter, uh, had been married before but remarried and had their own party uh, about two or three weeks ago. And for the first time in my life, I wrote out a check for a million dollars and I gave her that at the party. She didn't know it was coming. I have to say, wow. <laughs> I thought you were going to mention the invention of your tie. I've we, never been able to get a cent out show of that, that because the law offices, <laughs> which are one of the big tie, they no longer wear ties at the law offices. <laughs> now, the third area of interest that I want to discuss, and even though you seem to be somewhat reticent to talk about this, I found it to be very unusual, and that is the area of music. The classical music book and soundtrack that you wrote in 2003, The Classical Music Experience. Tell us about this. Even though you were not a trained musician, lo and behold, 
here is this fabulous book on classical music and a tape, 40 hours of music. Did you ask me the year I was married? Yes. I said 1972. That was the second marriage. Okay. The first marriage was in uh, 1952 when I was starting my internship at Presbyterian. This must have brought it back to your mind then, the fact that this must have been That's right. wonderful music. <laughs> That's right. My present wife from 72 was president, past president of an organization called the 92nd Street Y, which is one of the important cultural uh, institutions which spread knowledge around about music and other things in the city. So because I was her new husband, I went to the, most of the concerts at the 92nd Street Y and I learned something about listening to music, but nothing about how to produce it. But when you listened, you heard other things. Well, I guess I did, yeah. Then what the classically trained, formally trained ear was reporting. It's nice of you to say that, at any rate. It's the true. selections are not, many of them are out of the standard, you know, ones that would be most popular. Let me ask you about what you consider to be the highlights of your career? Grandchildren. Wonderful. The fact that I've been able to do things philanthropically, Wonderful. I've gotten great pleasure out of, and, and the microsurgery. Who do you see as your mentors? Dr. Blaylock and Ravitch. And I don't know whether you know this, but Ravitch, who was Blaylock's assistant, ended up going to Mount Sinai. It was one of my early contacts with Sinai and probably why I got the job. My wives, who took all the manuscripts and put them into English. <laughs> well, at least good English. Why Blaylock? Just I, I, the, origi the originality of the Blue Baby operations and so on. And I felt Blakemore was one, uh, Blakemore and Voorhees were some of my early mentors, and uh, I wouldn't have done anything without those contacts. So these are, these are the people that I consider important. At the moment, I consider the man who's doing most of the work in wound healing, Harold Brem. Okay. You know that name? No, sir. He's doing original stuff and making something out of wound healing and he's hired his own basic scientists and so on and so forth. I think he's having a tough time with his career, but he's gotten a lot of money in grants so that he's uh, moving from place to place. He would be somebody for you to look into too. Now, we touched on this earlier, but I'd like you to expand on it if you would. All of us as human beings have failures, low points, um, disappointments, and yet you had an amazing ability to turn disappointment into later success. How, how did this happen? How were you able to do that? I think that? your def definition of amazing ability is totally incorrect, <laughs> and you tend to exaggerate to make a point. But it's but true. But that's fine. I'm happy for you. To, and I say, we'll come, I will come visit you every month. <laughs> <laughs> now, sit, here are some of the questions that the committee wanted you to address. The first is your opinion of endovascular surgery. Its contributions have been tremendous. And what, what's the, we used the term before, laparoscopic surgery. Right. I, I think these are among the important uh, developments in surgery. It happens today that I hadn't known about this. I've known about other institutes of, what's the term? This place? Simulation? Simulation surgery, right. I've known about that. In fact, I started at one point to start one at the University of Toledo, and then I went to a contribution that I considered even more important, and that was translational research. So I've established an institute of translational research at the University of Toledo. 
Are you, you, are you excited about this translational research, or do you know what it is? No, sir. Uh, the translational research is so exciting to me because what they do is take basic scientists and mix them with clinical scientists. So you will have a, a development which uh, has six breast surgeons and 10 uh, geneticists. Mm. And suddenly the geneticists are interested in the patients that are being operated on, able to study the genetics. And this is now spreading back and forth. And I think will account for the most exciting mm. age of surgical research that I know about. Several years ago, <clears throat> An effort was made to establish an independent board of vascular surgery, which failed. What, what is your opinion on this, and, and why do you think it failed? People. That's all. Just uh, egos. I think it's ridiculous. I need your opinion on the decline of international exchange of training residents. Do you think this is because of the merger of SVS and ISCVS? Or do you think that we're just not paying enough attention to this? No, I think that the, uh, the costs involved in training residents cannot be borne by most of the world. It's, it gets expensive. Very expensive. And all the things of this, uh, we're in this institute right today, and how many millions of dollars have they spent to the these beginning instruments. It's 10 million. And uh, strangely enough, the man who's now ahead of it was a friend of mine uh, at, when he was chairman of surgery, but he's now in this new field. Fabulous. And what he was, was an excellent surgeon, I might add. What was your favorite operation? I, I just think the bypasses in the legs. And finally, what is your advice to young surgeons coming up today? Get as much training as you can, decide what you like to do best and do it. Dr. Jacobson, thank you for making this time. The insults that I've extended toward you? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>